So welcome everybody to Geospatial Forum. And I would like to welcome Camila Mahon from Mapbox, who doesn't know Map Mapbox. Yeah. Nobody. So everybody knows where <laughs> Well, oh, okay, one. <laughs> so uh, everybody knows where Camila is coming from, where she works, where she works, and she's the satellite product manager at Mapbox, and she develops data partnerships uh, that make Mapbox imagery layers possible. So if you have worked with Mapbox, you have seen those layers. Uh, you can thank her for <laughs> for putting this together, and. Uh, uh, she studied spatial statistics and remote sensing at Clark University, so she has GIS background, but she also has Bachelor's of Arts in Government, studying American politics, <laughs> international relations, and political theory, so very interdisciplinary. So let me welcome Camila, and uh, uh, without you, um, further ado, please uh, uh, let us know, and we are very uh, eager to learn more about cool. the... Uh, uh, remote sensing that you are doing at Nightbox. Awesome. Thanks, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Awesome. Hey, everybody. How's sound? Is this working? We're fine. It's not that big of a room. Cool. Um, thanks for having me. Um, how many folks in here are remote sensing folks? Okay, cool. About half the room. Okay, cool. So if there are like terms or anything that I'm talking about, up here that you don't know, just shout it out. Um, you can just yell at me anytime. Um, but that being said, I'm going to try to stick to my script because with jet lag and the time change and my propensity for going on tangents, I'm going to try and cut, you know, keep it to 45 minutes here. Um, cool. So I'm Camilla. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm here from San Francisco uh, from Mapbox, as you know. Um, so over the last few days, I actually had a realization that um, I'm usually on the other side of this topic set. I'm usually talking to develop developers, job applicants, customers, other industry folks about remote sensing, earth observation, kind of what, what is change detection, what can you do with imagery, um, what are spectral signatures and all that stuff. Um, but I feel like you guys are pretty well versed in all of those geospatial topics. Um, so coming into a room of geospatial scholars um, to talk about industry is uh, kind of a fun flip for me. Um, so what does industry mean? Um, industry can mean a ton of different things. Um, you know, it could be something in finance that has a geospatial component, agriculture, defense, emergency services, autonomous vehicles, um, and so much other stuff. Uh, for this talk, um, industry means web development um, and the tooling world. Uh, so some people would just call this the, te the technology sector. Um, but either way, uh, web development and tooling ends up um, kind of serving a lot of these other industry sectors um, that I just mentioned. Um, cool. So that's kind of a good kicking off place for um, this discussion, which is the idea of being on the side of building tools versus using tools. Um, I think it's probably a worthwhile question for anybody um, who's going into industry just to ask yourself. Um, which side of that do you want to be on? Do you want to be on the side of building tools, working for an Esri, or a Cardo, Mapbox, Planet, Digital Globe, those types of folks? Um, or do you want to be more on the um, side of using those tool sets and data sets to answer questions um, and be kind of more in the field solving problems? Um, so just try and keep that in mind as you hear about some of this stuff. Um, all right, so uh, I've been on the tool building side of things. Um, I'll tell you about my experience building things at Mapbox, um, as well as the use cases that we try to fulfill. Um, I'll touch a little bit on who's using the tools that we build and the data that we provide, um, what it means for their workflows, and then what we haven't built yet. Um, so before I go too much into that, uh, let me just give you a little bit more of my background. Um, so prior to working at Mapbox, um, I worked on geospatial problems for the Trust for Public Land, uh, managed their data for Maine, Vermont, and New Hampshire. Um, worked for the Preservation Resource Center in a post-Katrina New Orleans. Um, did some work with some local uh, organizations in um, post-earthquake Haiti. Um, I really have a passion for empowering communities to make their own decisions. Um, usually this is meant collecting and disseminating geographic information to inform decision making. Um, so 
I'll get to this in a second. <laughs> my, my first mapping gig was um, was for the Preservation Resource Center, Center in New Orleans. Uh, that was in 2008. Um, so we were working for um, in conjunction with the Neighborhood Association uh, to get a basic understanding of all of the um, status of all the properties in a neighborhood. Um, you know, was the grass cut? Were windows broken? How bad was the flood damage? Um, do we know if the family was planning to return? Um, and this was all in the interest of eventual neighborhood rebuilding. Um, you know, we'd go from on-foot surveys to CSVs to ArcMap um, and make information of all the, or make maps of all the information that we'd gathered and presented at neighborhood association meetings every week. Um, and I really loved this because we would put up this map and we'd have people coming up at the end of the neighborhood meeting to say, oh, I see you don't have information about this property or you don't know who owns this building. Um, and they would give it to us right there on the spot. Um, and I loved that kind of participatory data gathering mapping um, workflow. And that's really what kind of got me into um, doing this as a career in general. Um, so since then, um, I mentioned some of the other things I did. Ended up at Clark University, which is where I um, discovered remote sensing. And that um, was really kind of a special uh, mind-opening moment for me, going from doing door-to-door -door data collection to seeing what you can gather from satellites and just the amount of information that you can um, have about the world um, through, um, through these remotely sensed data sets. Um, so um, my jam at Clark was global weather patterns. Um, I just thought this was super fascinating stuff. Um, the phenomenon that I fo focused on was called El Nino Madoki, which is um, kind of the changing face of El Nino where usually you have um, war this warm water mass sitting in the far um, east or west of the Pacific Ocean, but increasingly we're seeing that warm water mass sitting in the central Pacific Ocean, uh, which you're seeing here, that's sea surface temperature. Um, and that is affecting um, lower tropospheric temperature and precipitation all over the globe. Um, so that's kind of what I did, did at Clark. Um, and so I, I got really interested in um, some of the technology behind the analyses that we were running. Um, you know, we would sit in the lab and run a process for sometimes hours and sometimes days. And um, I would get really frustrated wanting to be able to do kind of more data crunching faster. Um, and that's what um, kind of pushed me to jump over to the Mapbox opportunity where I could learn about scaling and running things in the cloud and um, making processes um, uh, faster and easier. So finally, Mapbox. What are we doing at Mapbox? Um, so uh, sounds like you guys are pretty familiar with Mapbox, but just really briefly, uh, Mapbox is a mapping platform for developers. Uh, we provide global data sets for streets, terrain, imagery, um, as well as data styling tools, space to ho host your own custom data. Um, and we maintain a bunch of open source libraries for working with geographic data as well. Um, for most of my time at Mapbox, I've been on the Mapbox satellite imagery team, um, which is really kind of the all things raster data team. Um, and when I started at Mapbox, we were in the early stages of building our first imagery based map of the world. So this is a high level view of Mapbox satellite. Um, this is, uh, you know, taking MODIS data, Landsat data, Digital Globe, uh, NAIP survey, and a bunch of other openly licensed aerial surveys and compiling them into a zoomable, pannable map of the world. Um, so we're making this out of compilations of imagery from a bunch of different sources that sometimes look like this. <laughs> um, or this. <laughs> so a lot of openly licensed data. You have to grab it from FTP servers. It's compressed really poorly. You get all these crazy imagery artifacts so you have to end up dealing with. Um, no data values that are undetermined in metadata um, are sometimes inconsistent across imagery from the same provider. Uh, this is a really funny case where the provider tried to make the no data values somewhat close to the water color <laughs> and also didn't encode it in the metadata. It's a really big pain in the butt to deal with. Um, so pretty painful to deal with some of these data sets and to deal with this coming from all sorts of different providers, um, again, with like not very, very well documented metadata. Um, so we attempt to fix these issues um, by writing little scripts to deal with the compression, uh, color balancing. Sometimes we would end up decimating more of the image than we meant to. Um, <laughs> also, you, you'll notice the trampoline. 
Uh, trampolines are incredibly, incredibly popular in Northern Europe. <laughs> and Northern Europe also has a lot of openly licensed aerial surveys, like all of, all of Denmark has a free open aerial survey, a lot of cities in Germany. Um, Finland has a great open aerial survey, and you'll find a lot of trampolines in those, <laughs> in those backyards up there. Um, so we also built uh, tools to help us identify good and bad quality imagery in our map. Uh, this is something we call the Satellite Health Index. Um, the orange is showing a quality measure, um, kind of a Boolean value of good versus bad. And then the green is showing um, map tiles where we have uh, a lot of user activity. So this is helping us um, update and improve imagery where our users need it most. All right, so we slowly made things work. Um, as we worked with more and more sources of imagery and we scaled this all to a uh, global process, uh, we ended up tying this all um, into an image processing chain we call Pixel Monster. That's our image processing software. Um, Pixel Monster allows us to stop examining no data values on a case-by-case -case basis, spatial resolution, projection, um, and uh, you know, instead we're able to pull metadata automatically um, and have uh, a bunch of servers make decisions for us and uh, stitch and tile this imagery together. Uh, our CTO <laughs> drew us a mascot for Pixel Monster. All right, so what's Pixel Monster built on top of? Um, I talked to a few people about GDAL. You guys familiar with Geospatial Data Abstraction Library? Cool, this is a great open source project, really good on the command line. Um, Russ, Rosterio or Rosterio um, is a Python wrapper around that. Um, we also at Mapbox do pretty much everything on Amazon Web Services. Um, most companies you'll go to are either on uh, AWS, Microsoft Azure, or Google Cloud. Um, and I just wanted to mention uh, these two other libraries that get used really frequently. So Shapely is also um, it's kind of the sister to Rasterio. Um, and TurfJS is a JavaScript library for doing um, geospatial stuff in the browser. Um, so we use these things also for some of our other tooling. Um, but the majority of our um, image processing pipeline is really built with GDAL. OK, so what is this? Um, talking about AWS, um, uh, you know, Pixel Monster is not just about scaling our metadata discovery. Uh, but also about scaling our compute resources. Um, so in addition to automating the handling of imagery artifacts, uh, we're also able to automate the processing of our TIFFs, our Mr. SIDs, JPEGs, ECWs, um, and reprojecting all of that into uh, Web Mercator map tiles that are ready to be served on the web. Um, are people familiar with um, web tiles and just getting things into a format that can be served in a browser for imagery or map data in general? I'm seeing some nods somewhat. Cool. So um, map data on the web is served in a, in a tiled gridded system. So every zoom level, um, uh, I wish I had a whiteboard. Um, can I use that? Uh, that's OK. I can just explain. Yeah. We can talk later if you want to talk more about, about tiling technology. But basically, um, the world is cut up into a gridded system. Um, and every time you zoom a level deeper, um, every grid square gets cut into four tiles. Um, and that just continues all the way down to zoom level, I think, 23 is the max right now. Um, so um, scalability in terms of creating tiles. Um, so once we got this concept going for um, our own creation of the Mapbox satellite base map, um, we wanted to kind of push our capacity um, in terms of compute power to see if we could do this in kind of a live streaming way. Um, so this is a project um, that we built now, you know, four, four almost five years ago. Um, this is pretty early on when I started. This is called Landsat Live. Um, so this is a project that is constantly rolling in Landsat scenes, filtering them for a certain uh, cloud cover, and then publishing it to a, a live map on the web. Um, I think we actually have the domain name landsat.live if you want to check that out. It's now got a metadata inspector, so you can see when each scene was collected um, uh, and some of the other stuff that gets um, collected, sun angle and all that. Um, 
Cool. So this was a really fun project to, um, to kind of push on the bounds of what it means to do live data processing um, and have that constantly be streamed to a website. Um, so where do we go from here with Pixel Monster? You know, we built a pipeline that allows us to update our own map. Um, and that supports a large section of our customer base. Um, we've built Landsat Live, which is a neat proof of concept for real-time data processing. Um, and our next step is really to expose this processing capability to more folks. Um, so on the satellite team, that image is, looks kind of funny. Um, on the satellite team, one of the activities we've always been engaged in is disaster response. Um, so working with the Red Cross, humanitarian open street map. Um, I know some of you are familiar with open street map. Um, if you're not familiar with HOT, you should definitely check them out, the humanitarian open street map team. Um, they do humanitarian map creation tasking um, all over the world. Um, so working with, with them, HOT, Red Cross, Digital Globe to get imagery into the hands of folks who need it as soon as possible so that it can be used to build maps um, of damaged areas, to get initial map data sets of areas that aren't mapped yet. Um, and we've helped with a number of different response efforts from hurricanes to earthquakes to mapping for health services um, after the Ebola outbreak or malaria incidents, things like this. Um, this particular image, it looks a little bit worse than usual. I might have stretched it too far, but this is some drone data that was taken in Vanuatu after um, a particularly bad storm blew through. And so the polygons that you see on top of buildings are just um, associating uh, levels of damage with each of the buildings that you see there. Um, okay, so on our team, end up, uh, uh, on our team, a lot of what we end up uh, talking about and thinking about is how do we get data that has traditionally been really hard um, and heavy to distribute into the hands of people who need it faster. Um, and what we learned from starting to advertise our Pixel Monster service to folks is that pretty much everybody wants more data faster. <laughs> um, and a lot of these folks are actually uh, data providers who want to be able to serve their customers more effectively. So we got a really, really high level of interest from um, you know, people collecting satellite imagery or doing aerial flights or doing some of this drone data collection at scale. Um, keep in mind, it was only two years ago that Digital Globe, are you guys familiar with Digital Globe? Okay, cool. Just in, for anybody who, who might not be, Digital Globe is um, kind of the premier commercial um, satellite imagery provider in the world. <clears throat> um, they have a big constellation of super massive billion dollar satellites. Um, one of actually which just had an issue. Um, they just launched a new, <laughs> this is me and my tangents, um, but they launched a new satellite last year, Worldview 4, which just in January um, had a, uh, a gyro failure, and so they're not sure if they're going to be able to fix it, but this was a $1.83 billion satellite. Crazy. They are insured for it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's another crazy thing to look into is satellite insurance. Go on a Wikipedia dive. <laughs> All right, so it was only a couple of years ago that Digital Globe moved their archives to the Amazon Cloud for easier access. Um, and while the cloud and tiled map services are getting more popular by the day, there are still a whole lot of companies out there that are managing their data sets on tapes and hard drives. Woo! -hoo. <laughs> um, so on top of tapes and hard drives, there's still a whole lot of data out there that needs to travel through the mail to get to a place that can process it. Um, so aerial imagery collections are um, particularly at the mercy of FedEx and UPS on any given day. Um, you know, data processing centers that take in that raw data, run all of the orthorectification, initial color balancing, um, really only exist in a few places. Um, and the data needs to actually be there on site to be processed. Um, and you know, if you're going cloud first, say you're going to use the Amazon bulk upload service, you still need to go from capture on the plane to, that, to a spot where they can upload that. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about like, who cares about this timeline from data collection to data availability and why. I think the um, use case of emergency services, uh, things like that, is, is 
uh, on the more obvious side of things. Um, but let's consider the casual map user. Um, someone who's browsing around on Google or Bing or Mapbox um, is going to want to see data that is consistent with the real world. Um, if a building is there or isn't there, that should be reflected in the map. Um, if an entire city block is under construction, um, it'd be helpful to see that. Um, if I am uh, a logistics fleet driver and I need to go do a drop off at uh, you know, a major um, warehouse center and that warehouse center isn't on my map, I'm going to have trouble routing there. Um, and so let's say that a given aerial collection keeps a reasonable amount of fidelity with the real world for one year. So I collect uh, the city of Raleigh or all of North Carolina or all of the Bay Area. Let's say that that imagery is relatively useful for a year. Uh, so let's say you're a mapping company or an insurance company or an analytical firm who buys that imagery set for a million dollars. Every day that you don't publish or use or do whatever you need to do with that imagery, you are effectively losing almost $3,000 on that imagery purchase. That's a lot of money. <laughs> so anyone paying for imagery also cares about this kind of time to live issue. Okay, so we've talked about image processing at scale, uh, why this concept of time to live or time to availability matters. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about modes of collection and enabling things um, outside of the obvious visible light and top-down view. <clears throat> um, so while uh, major mapping players in tech space are mostly concerned with red, green, blue values, visible imagery to satisfy their user bases, um, we remote sensing folks, those who are in here, uh, know that there's a lot to see beyond what's just in the visible spectrum. Um, this is a really large fire on the Russia-China border. Um, I just love this image. Um, it's really hard to discern uh, here where the actual extents are of the burn area, particularly with the smoke um, in the upper corner. Um, but if you look in the non-visible spectrum, that becomes super obvious. Yeah. Um, and I can't remember the band combination I used for this. Sorry. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, potentially, yeah, because the smoke is gone. Um, but uh, I feel like this <laughs> slide usually gets a lot of oohs and ahs from crowds who are not familiar with remote sensing, but I know you guys are all, <laughs> <laughs> all geoscholars in here, so. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, no, I'm just teasing. Um, so yeah, so we all know about, about the importance of working outside of just the, the obvious vis visible spectrum. Um, so let's also talk about working outside of, um, uh, of our normal top-down view. This is a really cool image that Digital Globe captured when I think Worldview 3 was uh, off the coast of California. And they, this is a total experiment. They took their sensor and tilted it as far as it would go towards the land and took this snapshot of San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so super cool to see you know, the, the terrain and the buildings and you know, the height on the bridge and everything, just not, not a view you typically see um, from a satellite perspective. Um, so this is really just a proof of concept, but also just very cool way of using data um, in a new way. Um, this oblique view is a lot more popular and common in aerial imagery collections. Um, so this is a, an, uh, a shot from Eagle View Technologies. Um, they're one of the major aerial imagery flyers in the United States. Um, and this type of stuff gets used for construction and contracts and or for contractors and insurance companies that are trying to do you know, damage assessments or assess how much a building is worth. Um, and this is uh, some type this, this type of data is something that we've recently opened up the availability to use in um, the Mapbox platform. Um, so this has been a lot of our work over the last year, um, figuring out how to uh, correctly um, consume all of those camera parameters so that we can accurately represent um, an angled imagery in web space. Um, uh, and drone imagery uh, comes in oblique forms as well. Um, this is a... Um, relatively devastating image that was taken 
after the Santa Rosa fires um, in uh, Northern California. This was uh, two years ago now. Um, but this, uh, this was a really interesting project to work on. Uh, this was the Santa Rosa Sheriff's Department actually collected this data and um, needed help disseminating it to the public because they really wanted to get it in front of people before they return to their neighborhood to help kind of like grasp the situation before you just got back to your neighborhood and saw it in this state. All right, so that's a little bit about oblique perspective. Has, it, ha, has anybody here worked with oblique imagery, just out of curiosity? Yeah, yeah, right, the U of E stuff. You guys are doing structure from motion and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, cool. Yeah, it's really fun, interesting space, um, really useful. Uh, okay, so um, I did want to talk to you guys just about some of the other players in the hardware and data collection space um, outside of um, some of the old school people. Oh, so this is, this is the Digital Globe, one of those massive satellites. Um, I think probably a lot of people here are familiar with Planet Labs uh, or just Planet now. They got rid of the labs. <laughs> They're out of child phase. Um, uh, I know we've got some UAV folks in here. Um, this is a MicaSense sensor. They're doing some really cool technology. I think they're based in the Pacific Northwest doing um, Red Edge and stuff like that. Um, the folks that I really wanted to highlight here, which I'm not sure if anybody's heard of yet because they're pretty new on the scene, um, Capella Space uh, is doing um, synthetic aperture radar collections. Um, they're pretty new on the scene. Uh, and I think that in terms of talking about outside of the visible spectrum, um, and outside of the data sets that we normally think about on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, SAR data is becoming really, really um, popular and important um, to collect and to use for things like change detection, especially at a really minute scale. Um, and the other folks here, um, this is a really cool satellite that uh, has a big um, kind of folding <coughs> out um, mechanism um, that is doing methane gas leak detection. Um, and this company is called Bluefield. Um, and uh, they're also very new on the scene. Um, just a, another really cool, interesting data stream that's outside of the visible spectrum, outside of what um, you know, we normally consume, particularly in just the consumer mapping space. Okay, so this is obviously not exhaustive at all, but I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of a taste of um, kind of what's out there so you can start to go and explore on your own and just kind of break out of um, some of the normal data providers that you're used to thinking about. Um, I know that um, being in academia, um, you can't always pay for data sets, so things like Digital Globe and Eagle View and some of these other proprietary data sets are not going to be available to you, but a lot of these newer companies um, are probably open to uh, research grants and just like allowing people to play with their data as, um, as they're new on the scene. So definitely don't hesitate to reach out to them if you if you have a, an interest. All right, so that's a good segue into the uh, complicated ownership over different parts of the kind of remote sensing, data collection, processing, and distribution um, chain. Um, so who is doing what in the space? Let's see, I'm going to talk through just a few of these to give you guys a sense of um, what the different breakdowns are. So in um, kind of the remote sensing industry technology world. Um, there's some people out there who are just doing um, like image processing. That would be uh, like an open drone map. I know Kellen, you were thinking about using open drone map. Um, that's a really cool project. Uh, it came out of the Cleveland Metro Parks Department. Um, the people running that are just really smart, really nice, um, and they're doing a lot of cool structure from motion stuff that's all open source. Um, so that's an example of a project that's just on the image processing side of things. Um, there are other people who do, uh, you know, the collection, data collection, and calibration against their sensor met metadata, orthorectification, all that good stuff. So, you know, Digital Globe, NASA, ESA, um, some aerial folks are like AirOptic, Eagle View, Hexagon, Sanborn. Um, and then there are folks who are doing um, analysis for specific use cases. Uh, those are people like SpaceNow and Orbital Insights. Are you guys familiar with, with these folks? Um, so these are um, kind of like insights firms. So they'll take in customers from the financial sector or wherever um, and, and basically run analytical processes for them at scale on satellite imagery. Um, We've got uh, people doing uh, distribution for broad use cases, so these, these major map providers like the Mapboxes, Cardo, Here, Bing, 
Um, uh, open aerial map. Are you guys familiar with open aerial map? A few nods. So open aerial map is kind of like the newer on the scene um, raster data equivalent to open street map. So they're trying to crowdsource people's drone data collections. Um, so you can go on there and just download you know, random drone collections from all over the place. They've also uh, actually at this point pulled in some aerial surveys and, um, and I think you can get Landsat data through that as well. Um, just another interface for Landsat. Um, people who are on the compute power side of things, I've mentioned AWS, uh, Microsoft Azure. Uh, and then, you know, the reason that I say the complicated ownership over different parts of this whole chain is that there are some people who are trying to um, kind of like do the whole pipeline from data collection to serving every use case at the end of it. So like Planet Labs uh, or Planet, um, they uh, are obviously collecting all of their own data, but they've also created their own web interface so that people can access tiled imagery directly and, um, and play with their data just right in, in one single ecosystem. Um, Drone Deploy is uh, doing something similar where they also have a tiled map service um, so a lot of people kind of getting, getting into that full end-to-end -end piece. Um, I was just talking to Corey about AWS uh, starting their ground station program. Um, so AWS is now partnered with Digital Globe also to be downlinking and distributing um, satellite imagery data. So kind of fascinating just to see people um, kind of jumping, jumping over uh, into, into spaces that they didn't necessarily kind of start their core, core at. All right, so again, just um, wanted to give you guys kind of an overview of some of the stuff happening in the industry. By no means exhaustive, um, just, just some fun stuff to get started with. All right, so how are these technologies being applied? Um, we talked a little bit about disaster preparedness and response. Um, some things that I'm really interested in are like search and rescue, um, forest succession, land change over time, global weather monitoring, um, as, as I showed you guys earlier. This is um, just a basic uh, application um, showing, um, second play again, um, just showing land change with a slider. Um, so this is some of the type of stuff that you can build with you know, the right data sets and the right tooling thrown up on the web. Uh, this is Lake Titicaca. Uh, this was actually a few years ago, some um, seasonal change in the land cover. It's kind of crazy you see this tiny little city that's getting close to being underwater. Um, here's an example of something that Strava built um, on top of Mapbox tooling. Um, so uh, showing their uh, telemetry or user traces uh, on top of imagery so you can basically see what is the land use pattern um, and you can change the opacity of things here. Oh, wow, are we? Oh, no, no, no. I thought, <laughs> I thought we were over an hour already, but it's just been 30 minutes. Okay, whew. <laughs> I didn't go on that many tangents, only one or two. Um, okay, so what is this? What are we looking at here? Oh, okay, so this is actually getting right to the end here. Um, cool, so uh, we talked a little bit about the Santa Rosa um, fires earlier. This is um, the actual application that, uh, that we helped build for the um, Sheriff's Department. Um, so zoomable, panable, this is tying in uh, the drone data imagery collection um, uploaded into the Mapbox platform. Um, you click on a property uh, and hit our geocoder, so that allows you to get the address for a certain location. Um, and of course you have the zoom and pan and the street labels on top and some other interactivity here. Um, so this is what residents of the neighborhood were able to see before um, returning to their damaged properties. Um, so uh, that is uh, a brief overview of some of the things that I've done at Mapbox, um, some of the other players in the space out there, um, how some of this tooling ties together into um, applications like this. Um, and that is what I've got for you guys today. Thank you. I think they were using DJI stuff. I think they're using Phantoms. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Is the uh, project to upgrade the projection cable 
capabilities of Google of protecting your work at all? To upgrade the projection capabilities. Yeah, the Google Bard raising, the SRS bar. Oh, um, n no, not it's not really impacting us super directly. Um, we don't have any folks who work heavily on the maintenance of GDAL. Um, that's more Frank, crazy Frank <laughs> over at um, Planet. Um, but yeah, he and um, uh, Evan Renault are mostly working on that. Um, and we will, you know, chat with them from time to time, and we'll have work to do um, in the Python wrappers around that. But other than that, we're, we're not really feeling it so much. Okay. Yeah. Are you making use of the cloud optimized GeoTIFF format? Yet? Yes. Um, yeah. So cloud optimized GeoTIFFs um, are a lot of what we've also been working on this past year, uh, and what. We're hoping that will unlock is um, being able to tile things on the fly. Um, so right now, uh, when we process imagery, we cut it up into tiles and then store those tile sets um, and serve them out from an S3 bucket. Um, but uh, we're uh, hoping to move to a system where um, we just have kind of a, a um, cloud-optimized GeoTIFF storage bucket and are able to call um, images on the fly and have them tiled by the browser um, as they get requested by a user. Yeah, so cut down on storage and um, use that instead. Yeah. Uh, I was particularly struck by your uh, discussion of the data being delivered. Oh. I mean, what percentage do you think of it? And, and do you have any sense of like how that's going to go away, that problem. Um, of uh, delivery on snail mail. Yeah. yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot lately, actually. You know, it's kind of funny. We have these downlink systems for satellites, but not for aerial collections. Um, I don't necessarily have a sense of how quickly that all will change. But one of the things that we talk about a bit is um, I meant to mention this actually on one of the slides. Um, the power of processing chips um, and what you can actually do on device. So for a drone data collection to be able to um, parse through data and understand like what's useful and what's not before you try to pull it off of that sensor. Um, you know, this is something that uh, is done on a lot of satellites already these days. Um, so try to make that lighter. Um, try to actually get some of the image stitching done earlier. Um, could all be things that might um, collapse that timeline and collapse the amount of stuff that actually needs to be moved around. Um, but other than that, I'm not I'm not super well versed in some of the other innovations that may be happening um, on that space of trying to cut down of like driving a hard drive somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Yeah. Um, at the very beginning, you mentioned that you've been spending all this time on the YouTube job applicants. Yep. In addition to the geospatial skills, um, what other skills are you seeing that you're really excited about, or what do you wish you were seeing um, from job applicants? Yeah, um, that's interesting. Um, I think that the combination, uh, yeah, we find the combination of the geospatial skill set with uh, a little bit of capability either on the command line or um, with Python programming. Um, you know, Mapbox is, is mostly a JavaScript house, but our, the imagery team is very heavily Python based, um, just working with, with arrays and, and manipulating images. Um, so being able to have some, some web development experience plus geospatial is, is a real silver bullet. You know, we actually get a lot of developer applicants who are not familiar with geospatial stuff at all. So coming in with a geospatial background you already have a bit of a leg up um, because, um, yeah, imagery data is not, it's not the easiest thing to work with, and, and geospatial stuff is really not the easiest stuff to work with. I think there's a lot of gotchas there. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about the um, oblique satellite. Yeah. Is that something you get to see being a satellite pod in Bloomberg? I don't. 
think so necessarily. I think there's probably enough other data sets out there that are accomplishing that. Um, but it is kind of an interesting proof of concept. I haven't, I haven't seen any kind of movement or interest in expanding that beyond beyond that looking old. Because actually, more often than not, you get people complaining about <laughs> about building lean and and images that are off nader. Um, because they really want a, a super clean top-down view. They don't want shadows, and they don't want, you know, these urban canyons being obstructed by by building lean. But that's that's also very much a consumer uh, use case. Um, and sometimes machine learning um, algorithms will really hate when when buildings are tilted one way or another. Um, but it would be kind of interesting to see an explicitly purposeful oblique satellite product. Right, right. I wonder. Yeah. Yeah. How does this get revised? Whether you're measuring a structure that is oblique, yeah. or you're measuring just something on the ground, because no, it needs to take into account the angle. It's just yeah. a stupid raster. So yeah. How do you even do that? It's been a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, the quick explanation is that. We are taking the camera parameters for that oblique image and basically forcing them into geographic space to tie that image down. Um, and then to get that measurement, we're also hiding a terrain layer underneath that image so that we have the elevation values um, associated with that as well. Yeah. That are not solid. You have just a, a tower that was there to detect wire. Oh, yeah. So how right, because it's really just measuring a distance um, and converting that to a height based on the underlying elevation values. Yeah. And that application is specifically for measuring vertical? Yes, exactly. Yep. Yeah, vertical height. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can't, that specific application, you can't like flatten it and then measure. Um, measure length and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, so that would have to, yeah, it would be a, a different application if you were to do that. Yeah. Third follow-up. Oh, sorry. <laughs> what will that be released? You said you the oblique stuff? Yeah, you said. Oh, good question. Make a phone call. No. <laughs> um, uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure how soon that will be packaged up and ready to go. Um, hopefully this year. Yeah, I mean, six months? Three? I don't know. Send some emails. Yeah, <laughs> just start harassing us about it, and we'll do it faster. <laughs> yeah, that I yeah. Uh, since you're doing the 3D stuff, have you started ingesting the LiDAR data yet? So um, I was talking to some folks about this earlier today. So we are, we can ingest LiDAR data. We're not really doing it at a large scale, um, at least not on our team right now. Um, but it is possible to ingest that in the Mapbox platform and, and play around with it. But um, you know, there are a lot of other companies out there, particularly in the autonomous space, that are really, like have these massive pipelines for ingesting that type of stuff. They're doing really, really heavy 3D modeling, um, and we are still somewhat in kind of like the two and a half D space. Like our camera tilt for the map only goes so far, unless you're using Unity or one of these other plugins. Um, and uh, yeah, and we just we haven't haven't really. Uh, uh, scaled out our, our LiDAR processes. No, they don't do anything. We just thought it was hilarious that every neighborhood had like at least one trampoline per backyard. Sometimes two. I don't know. It's like every yeah. over and when I, the first time I actually think about it, but then I just think back home, yeah, we do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's so funny. No, so that's just a, that's just an old joke. That's <laughs> just cracks me up every time. Does the little prince have something to do with your work? Say again. Does the little prince have something to do with your work? Oh, that's <laughs> funny. The little that is very little prince. That's funny. My uh, notebook is also little prince themed. No, this, <laughs> this is. Uh, this is an image from um, one of my performance reviews with our CTO where he asked, 
you to draw a, do a picture of a dog in space <laughs> as one of our prompts. So I've just been using it as my closing slide. <laughs> That's funny. Nobody's ever asked me about that before. <laughs> We are professionals here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is great. <laughs> yeah, that is kind of, it's supposed to be my dog. I have a dog. Her name is Leia. That's Leia in space. <laughs> yeah, Princess Leia, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any why? Um, uh, I guess, well, we, I think we started talking about that. I don't remember what, the, what was the question that prompted it. Maybe just what are some of the newer things that we're working on as a company. And I do think that uh, ride sharing and autonomous vehicles is kind of like the newest, flashiest, biggest stuff that we're working on as a company. Um, our involvement with that stuff on the imagery team is really more on um, like map provision side of things and providing imagery layers for things like feature extraction because all these autonomous companies are really interested in uh, this idea of the HD map which we were also talking a little bit about at, at lunch so being able to do really high def feature extraction um, so our role in that again has been providing input data for um, for their extractions um, but um, that really scales beyond just the autonomous space. You know, we have folks who are doing solar potential who are also doing the same type of ML work um, just for rooftop extraction as opposed to lane designation extraction on, on roads. So yeah, for the imagery team, I, I think we, we still think about our, our customers and our use case very broadly as opposed to just geared towards that. So I have a quick question. Uh, like you built the, the tiles from scratch, is that right? Yeah. The, uh, image, tile imagery. So essentially, so I, I was wondering, like, why did you use Mercator? If you were building, oh. from, I can understand that, like, many many years ago, when Google and Microsoft yeah. started, they didn't know anything about projections, so they just used right. Mercator. <laughs> yeah. So, so like maybe. <laughs> If you are doing it, yeah, if somebody's yeah, yeah. doing it from scratch, maybe they, they yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Web Mercator is still kind of the industry standard paradigm yeah. for um, for just serving base maps out on the web um, yes, because it's, yes, yes. it's kind of the most obvious for everybody. But definitely a lot of issues with it, uh, you know, on the analytical side of things or trying to get a real good yeah. sense of yeah. yes. We had scale. like a, at a conference somebody was yeah. mentioning that we now have a new generation of people coming out of age who think that uh, uh, Greenland is bigger than Africa. Yeah, I know, <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's funny. We were talking about um, kind of that uh, the analytical side of things and how much, you know, is Mapbox doing stuff with academia and, and how to, how to, what does that landscape look like? And I think in addition to enabling other projections, the other thing we talked about a little bit at lunch was um, enabling um, bit depths beyond 8-bit in the browser. So right now images are all squashed. All their values are, are completely decimated, but being able to open up 16-bit values mm -hmm. for comparison in the browser would also be, be big along with projections. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay, do we have any more questions? Thank you guys so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yes, thank